Greetings and salutations. I'm Josh Tyson, co-author of the first best-selling book about conversational AI, Age of Invisible Machines. The book explores the learnings of 20-year conversational AI veteran and OneReach.ai CEO, Rob Wilson. Each week, Rob and I bring in a guest to continue the conversation we started in the pages of our book. This week on the Invisible Machines podcast, we're talking about the importance of recognizing that for every profound idea, the opposite idea is also profound. Knowledge that can be gained from the flow variety found in excessive urination. The enduring value of the latch system for organizing information. The debatable prevalence of the term dick shit on our nation's streets. And the value in never doing the same thing twice. Our guest this week is Richard Saul Werman, creator of the TED conference an author of nearly 100 books, ranging from an innovative series of city guides to a collection of words by Louis Kahn, the famed architect who was an early mentor of Mr. Warman. I was compelled to reach out to him in the early days of this podcast, and he agreed to join us on the condition that we provide a transcript of the conversation to his archivist. I'd seen a video of him being interviewed at a TEDx Grand Rapids event by his archivist, as it turned out, and I was drawn to the freewheeling style of the conversation. Mr. Worman did not disappoint. As you'll see or hear, he pulls no punches while thinking out loud about a wide variety of topics. And rather than try to tease them all right now, let's just dive headfirst into this conversation with the incomparable Mr. Worman. I, uh, I was sitting upstairs this morning. I have one of those chairs that uh, you push a button and it massages you very well, and it helps me in the morning if I get up with a backache or so, it just refreshes me. I, <laughs> and I have my iPhone there by me, and my wife, before she went down, she said, just sitting there today? I said, yep, just sitting, doing my, uh, cleaning up my iPhone from overnight ads and things which are now dominate what well, i i suspect i don't i've never really asked this question but i suspect the fact that 85 percent of the emails i get are junk and i get rid of them and uh every once in a while there's one that's interesting that's junk uh that if I had pushed the button that I don't want any ads or don't want any of this, I wouldn't have seen some of that junk. And then it's, even if I don't read them, I know there's a register in my mind of what kind of junk I get and the amount of junk on certain subjects. You know, is it all clothing junk? Is it repairing knees and getting rid of, getting rid of uh, uh, swollen, calves junk uh what are the patterns in the junk that is that are ruled by what obviously has worked in the past so they continue to put it on there it's a filter that that as they try to market themselves market you who they send it to uh they're also marketing themselves as to what uh, uh what companies uh are making a, a living by uh, by advertising that way. So I know, as they seem to know more about me, I likewise know more about them by not having one of those filters that gets rid of all the shit. But 85% or 80%, whatever it is, unscientifically, uh, is... Ch so that's one thing I, I, I do. The second thing is I do have my chair work on my body, which is uh, refreshing. Um, and then I have, I hate to use the word meditation because it sounds so woo-woo and it sounds like I'm somebody other than what I am or what I've always been. I've always tried to have a, from my earliest days, it seemed natural that if you were going to begin anything, your day, a moment, a pause in the day, a project, uh, silence. You would try to work on however you work on your head. You can't 
I don't use my fingers. I just use my head to work on my head. How do I get rid of the gum, the gummy stuff in there so that uh, there is a, a, a modicum of clarity that I didn't have before? Or that I do harshly think of something, strongly think about something, and then see if I can flip it to the opposite of what I'm thinking. And that seems to work pretty well. That virtually anything that interests me, if I think of the opposite of what it is, from carnal things to beauty to trips to pain uh, to what somebody said to me to a new idea that I thought was cute, clever, or delicious. Um, and I think, and I f see if I can flip it and uh, enjoy that process too as a kind of little exercise. It's not, it's not so clever and it's not, uh, it's not meditation and I don't have to grow my beard longer to do it or wear white robes. Shit. Uh, so that's, but it's not a routine. I don't have a routine. I don't. I don't know of anything I've done twice. Uh, uh, I know what something I've done uh, too often uh, is pee, but I don't do it <laughs> way. And actually, I look at the pattern of my urination. Is it a horse pee? A minor horse pee? Is it a stuttering pee? Did I think I was going to pee more than I did because I had the urge <laughs> to really pee a lot, but it didn't come out a lot? And sometimes I surprise myself that I have a rather large pee when I didn't think I had that much, but I wanted to pee. I had that thing. And how peeing, a subject that people giggle at, you're all laughing because I'm talking about peeing, the, the subject itself is so, it's so pleasurable to pee, I mean, certainly I'd rather pee than have an ice cream cone when I have to pee. Uh, <laughs> ice cream cone is an image of joy. So peeing is one of the, it's, it's a, just like farting. It is enjoyable to get that pressure out of your stomach. And we, <laughs> and we make jokes about farting and comedians make jokes about farting. And then there's theories that we like, we don't mind, we kind of have a a, a feeling of connection with the smell of our own fart, but not the smell of other people's farts. And uh, it's such an, and in certain times in society, we think we read and we giggle at it in grammar school that uh, farting and belching and burping and everything was a positive sign of somebody's uh, pleasure about eating a meal and has turned into something that is an insult now. So, it's so okay. fun to watch. Kids These are my opening it. comments to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Wilson, I don't know you well enough to call you Rob, and I disdain this, I think, uh, awing weakness in our society where we call people by their first names when we don't know them. There are... Many people, I mean, if I put something down in my calendar, I don't want to call Mr. Rob up. I, I want to know your name. Uh, and uh, I would like you to call me Mr. Werman until you know my name. People ask me what they call, what they should call me. I said, well, if you're an old friend, you already know what you call me. If you're an old friend or quite an old friend from Philly, you call me Ricky. Others... In the in-between, call me Richard. Two or three people got to call me Saul. Uh, Charlie Eames called me Saul, and my best friend. And then his 10,000, 20, 30,000 employees call me Saul. Uh, Saul. Uh, that's uh, Jack Dangerman. I call him Jack, but he calls me Saul. Uh, and the first name. So it's the first name, but it's my middle name. I don't call him Mr. Dangerman. So my middle name's actually Rob, and my first name's Richard, ironically. Um, but from day one, my dad was Richard, so they called me Rob. Everybody called me Rob, and uh, and yeah, I I I always ask my mom why, you know, she gave me a name that needed a structure manual on on uh, how to get people to know what to call me. But the nice thing about having a middle name that people use 
is when someone says, hey, Richard, I know I don't know them, <laughs> which is nice. Well, well <laughs> but if I go to a conference and they have tags, and the tag has my first name, big, and my little name, not at all, or small, I won't wear the tag. Good. Because I don't want people who don't know me to call me by my first name. It's disrespectful. And it's not memorable. It is. Uh, yeah, fair now enough. that's like a little point, but it is pervasive in our society. A full yeah. sense of friendliness. And little things that make me friendly. You she should be yeah. that that's a good it's a positive. If I talk to younger people, which is almost everybody I talk to, because I'm gonna be eighty eight in a couple of weeks, that if I talk to younger people like yourselves and younger, they 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 they, they find it boring and distasteful that I make a point of this bold friendliness they have and that they think they're really yeah. being part of the people by calling them by their first name and you and could argue it's it's sort of sad because it, it shows that that we that our relationships are so shallow anymore that we think shallow ones are deep ones you know well i think it's terrible that we do this and do it across the world uh, I, I i you go into a uh go to a ticket counter if i buy something in this store and it comes up that they need to know my name. And I says, Mr. Werner, uh, and what's your first? I said, you have no business calling me by my first name. I don't know you. Yeah. Well, Charlene. I said, what is your last name? And they're uncomfortable with that. Like that, the last name is an invasion, invasion of, your, of your privacy, but that's exactly what you want. You want the privacy to know somebody more intimately if you're dealing with them enough to call them by their name. It's, <laughs> it's all fuck. This gets back to my earlier point. My earlier point was I try to flip every situation I'm into the opposite to see yeah. its merit in the opposite. Niels Bohr, who was maybe the only person that got a Nobel Prize uh, from from uh, Denmark. I keep on, I often say, I use his name and I say, the Nobel Prize winner from Denmark, but maybe there's others and I use it incorrect. I emphasize that so you think he may be the only person from Denmark. So I'll look that up. But anyway, he was, was, from, was... He was from Denmark. And uh, he got the Nobel Prize in quantum mechanics. We know that. And we know that he had terrible, violent debates with a very a, a good friend of his, Einstein. But they were good friends. He was younger, good friend. But a good friend... Uh, but they debated strongly in because they were both so passionate about their look at physics, one through quantum mechanics and Einstein, not on board yet. He got a little bit on board later in his life, but not really. Uh, and he, when he got his Nobel Prize, he said words to the effect, and he was rather filled with hubris and arrogance, as the best of us are. And... Uh, he said that uh, when he has a profound thought, uh, he realizes that the opposite is also profound. Yeah. Now, he's saying that not knowing that it's true or not. That's not a scientific fact. That's right. his recognition of radical alternatives. A joke, for instance, being the opposite of expectation. A radical alternative. That... In a radical alternative, it either more fully proves the original premise, or if it has something in it, it gives you parallel paths that you might loop together or braid together later on, and makes it also a clearer and 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 I think more more Hamisha, that's a Yiddish word, more manly a. Uh, idea to begin with so yeah i could see that i mean it's the synthesis of ideas and we all have our process and yeah the argument in our head is you know that putting that other person out there to argue with with us helps us understand our ideas and and ground them i wonder if 
that happens to you? How 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 much of your thinking happens with your mouth closed, and how much happens with my your mouth open? I know for myself, you know, some of my best ideas come when I'm when I'm sucking the oxygen out of the room and talking to somebody else. Um, and then sometimes it is introspective, and I think most people always imagine a quiet, thoughtful place, and that's you know, for me, it's sometimes it's just it's it's during talking that I that I actually, you know. I, I, it's almost selfish to the other person because <laughs> in so, in some ways they're not even there because I'm just uh, it's it's part of my process. I, I I don't know I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, you know, conversation. I'll, I'll, I will say th- I'll say three things about what you just said, which was a series of ideas. One, yes, yes, and yes. Two, the foolishest of saying, well, I don't know if it's true. It's just my idea of discounting and self-deprecating something that you believe in, which is unnecessary. You believed in what you just said, but you had to self-deprecate it and deprecate yourself to make you seem less arrogant and less sure of yourself. You so got it. <laughs> so, you know, so that I would yes. take it. That's just and, an electric shock therapy, you know? That's what happens. <laughs> but you did that because, you, you know, it's this kind of full humility of talking to somebody, of, of sort of, taking it away so somebody can come back in and say, oh, no, no, no. You know, you're really, yes. really thoughtful. Well, you're yes. too... I, I just, just for the record, I, I only, you know, I only do that w- w- while you're Mr. Werman. As soon as you become Richard no, no, or Saul, no, no, that, that, that goes away. <laughs> you're trying to find a clever out. No, that's not a clever out. You just do that because it's what's done. You're supposed to be a little humble. Absolutely. And... Yeah. Uh, I think you should get rid of it. Uh, yes. If you say something, well, somebody has one says, something don't be so humble, not you're not right. that great. If they prove you wrong, then they prove you wrong. Don't give them a soft way to prove you wrong. Just get out there and do it. You know? Yes. I, I'll, own it. I'll own it. I'll own it. percent Just own what you say. That's all. But yes, to both of those things. But you, I, scientifically, I use that for, uh, it, because I've, uh, there's no proof. Uh, uh, in my, I have no proof, and I think you have no proof in this. It's not worth the trouble of of getting the proof unless it's so absurdly lopsided that you are a silent person and all your thoughts are in your head, or you have no thoughts in your head and you only learn by talking. No, both, and you don't know where it begins, stops. But the only thing that you do all the time is have stuff in your head. And I have no idea whatsoever what you're thinking now. None. And you have no idea what I'm thinking. And this false notion that we're really understanding each other is bullshit. I'm either learning not or thinking something else or, you know, I have an itch in my crotch. I mean, (laughs) thinking of different things. Now, what is the pecking order between Mr. Green and Mr. Off-White? Mr. Green has green back there and you're off white. I'll be yeah. Mr. Green. Yeah. yeah. What's the pecking order? How do you work together? Uh, well, just say it. Yeah, we, we work together on a book. We co authored a book I called. I understand that, but how do you do it? Who we did it. Step? It was the second step. It's not absolutely even. No, of course. Uh, it really kind of began it, like this like a series of Zoom calls between Rob and I. And the book's uh, producer, Elias Parker, was there a lot too. And we would, Rob would talk a lot about his journey creating a platform um, for for orchestrating conversational AI. And I would listen and share ideas. And then we would just write about it. And there, it was a lot of collaboration like that. And then just kind of figuring out how all the ideas fit together in a way that would make sense to someone um, who's trying to wrap their head around the complexity of it because there are a lot of moving pieces to it. So... It was yeah. It was a, a really natural collaborative experience. Yeah, those conversations were essential, from my perspective. They're essential um, to to synthesizing the thinking. Even though there were thoughts and ideas, and 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 we thought we were right, we needed to synthesize those to 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 fully communicate them. But you had and, a th- and that conversation. Th- you had a third person there sometimes. That shocks me. Uh, facilitating, they were they were pretty absent to be 
to be clear, like in, in terms of the discussion, right? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, a discussion between two, a discussion between three and four, it just breaks down. But yeah. well, this discussion, uh, some make sure really our, we got on the form. The only parts of this discussion that will work is when the two of us are two, two different individuals are talking. You yeah. Know, yeah. Three, three just makes it a presentation or a, uh, you know, a, you know, a speech. But, well, it was uh, it was helpful for the third person to have familiarity with our discussions because he really helped organize uh, the book. Like he and I worked together closely to organize the book. So, but yeah, yeah. It, it was a it was a fruitful process. So, okay, well, that's I mean that's fine. It's just so it's foreign to me. So I'm <laughs> taking a step back. Yeah, yeah. It felt or... like we were making it up as we went along. That's for sure. Uh, we treated it like a user experience project in some ways. We user tested we portions of the book. Um. We took as much feedback as we could get. We worked with a really great editor um, on kind of the final draft. Uh, yeah, it was it was a very fun process. So I don't know. Maybe I'll try that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we got lucky. I think too. We just we enjoyed the process. So that doesn't always happen. Yeah. the The puzzle was we didn't we didn't want to talk about the same things everybody else is talking about, even even if we thought it was original thought and so we were we were thinking how can we know if what we're saying is 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 original or at least original enough to share and we're not just regurgitating the same ideas that are that are already out there so we thought well let's let's user test let's see if these ideas are fresh to people um cuz yeah we didn't just want to write a book um and and fill it with with uh, you know with with wasting other people's time, quite frankly, you know, just just repeating words that 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 were out there. My pattern is slightly different, and I do not propose it for other people. Uh, but I only I've done a bunch of books, and uh, you know, I guess they're close to a hundred. We say a hundred now. Yeah, uh, and they're just on different subjects, and I. They get written because I think of something, and I don't understand it at all. Or I have no, I, uh, I don't have a publisher. Uh, I don't have an editor. I don't have a PR person. Uh, I don't have any of those things. I don't have anything to bounce ideas off of, because nobody gives a dick shit about me. <laughs> no, I don't say that to be humorous. I mean, well, it was a humorous word choice. That's all. <laughs> well, it's my normal way of talking. A dick uh, shitting. <laughs> well, how, how would you express that? How would you express that same sentence better? Nobody gives a dick shit about me. How would you express it clearer? I'm not saying that I could. I think that was. Well, well, uh, then it's not a funny way of doing it. It's just, it's a horrifying <laughs> way of saying something. You know it was, but it was original. It oh, was yes. original. Dick shit is used in the streets all the time. Everybody uses that term, and they know what it means. I mean, Original I would. To me. <laughs> I would. I would. I would uh, use it on stage to describe myself or any place. I wouldn't. It would be because I couldn't say it clear. If you can think, if I if I thought of a clearer way of saying it, I would think it that way. Uh, yes. It wasn't it wasn't yes. said for the mirthful part of it. It is that nobody cares, which I can, I can say is true because this number is not right. It's low. It's conservative. But in the last 40, 45 years, nobody has ever asked me to do anything. I'm never asked to do a book, never asked to do a conference. I'm on nobody's board. The only thing that people ask is to be amused by talking to me on the phone or occasional speech. And those occasional speeches are, as you said, you watched one I did in, uh, and or let me see if I can remember it, in a church at a TEDx in Michigan at in Ann Arbor, I think. Was that correct? Uh, possibly. I thought it was Grand Rapids, maybe, but and maybe Grand Rapids, maybe Grand Rapids. Yeah. You told me that your archivist was the one who interviewed you. Okay, it was in Grand Rapids. Okay. Uh, at a TEDx in Grand Rapids, and he asked me to come. Um, uh, and give a give a give a talk. I don't prepare any talk. I have never prepared any talk in the last seventy years. Uh, and I don't use notes. Uh, and I don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, and it's the most calming thing in my life. 
uh, whether there's five people there, 5,000 people there, or the biggest I ever talked to was 21,000. Uh, I have absolutely just, if it's a, it's one of those measurements that you can't measure milliseconds or something, I think there's a millisecond uh, be, as I get up there of terror, but I'm not sure there is. But I know there is a palpable feel like a body wash of calmness that comes over me when I'm going to be, begin to talk and have no idea what I'm going to say. It is really, it's really nice. Uh, the beginning of this conversation is nice because it's the most interesting part. How do we begin? <laughs> what is the beginning like? Because what did I ask you first? What are your preconceptions? That's what I was about. I don't have any preconceptions. Well, already I know you're a liar. Because <laughs> you can't come into something like this, choose me to speak, talk, and not have some preconceptions walking into yeah. it. So my pre my biggest uh, preconception, I, guess, I think, I, was that it would be interesting. And well, but you didn't say that. I'm just you're right. You. I'm just saying I could have communicated more clearly. Well, you should have. I know. You should have not have communicated more clearly. You should have just been yourself. You don't have to make sense. We think what we're, as we get into a conversation, we're not thinking what words are coming next. It's one of, we have to yeah. learn to speak. We have to learn the language. We have to learn grammar. And then all of a sudden, at a certain time of our life, I don't know when, different for different people, the words are arranged correctly, differently in some, in, in other languages. Sometimes they put the adverb here or the noun here or the verb here. So it's different. You have to learn it. You have to learn the meaning of these words. I've never learned the spelling of words. I, I don't spell well. Uh, never got over that home. Uh, I can't type. I have no, I have no skill sets whatsoever. I can't, uh, I can't type. I can't uh, run fast. I can't all vault. I'm not the worst driver, not the best driver. I don't do anything really well. Uh, I do nothing really very well. Uh, except I think I know it. I know what I just said better than if you said it about yourself. I think if you said it about yourself, you would be doing it for effect. And I do it because I purely know what it's like not to know. I am really an empty, indulgent person with little compassion. And I say that with great comfort, knowing that I'm on the right track. Has it and always been that way? What do you call always? Well, for as long as you can remember? Or is it is it something well, you... I can remember back to when I was four. I remember being at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. No, I didn't know it then. Okay. So, so that's as long as I can remember. Somewhere in between. Uh, well, I thought it... I think it probably creeped up to me. And according to other people who are now dead, but according to other people who weren't particularly friends with each other later in their life at different times and them not talking together or the three of us together, uh, a pattern came up in their conversation that said that I was, uh, the, the way that I was different than who, who they were now, who they thought they were now and other people who were in my kindergarten, first grade, junior high school class, et cetera was that I had never changed. That I was the same now as I was then, and they felt they had changed. I don't think they were saying they changed for the better. It was not a criticism. It was an observation. Now, I might have chosen to take it not as a criticism and an observation, and it really was a criticism, but I don't... I don't now or then take it as a criticism. It wasn't said that way. And I thought about it and I realized, yeah, I don't think I have. Uh, I was not, it, it made it, 
as I look back on it now, because our memories, when you look back on them and analyze them, things occurred for one reason you can remember, but different now that you can see them attached to what happened next and in context. The contextual change in the meaning of your actions before it changes, and you understand it. And I can explain that more in a second. Um, I've never been to a shrink, so this doesn't come from some woolly mouth person, uh, which I said purposely, woolly mouth person. Um, that uh, a diversion for a second. During COVID, uh, I came up with the idea that there's some people that people have said were interesting to talk to, that they found interesting. There's people I wanted to talk to that I've never talked to, never met. So I made a whole series of cold calls to people I didn't know or just said, somebody said you were interesting. Uh, you can Google me if you like. You don't have to Google me. You can hang up now, obviously, if you like. I don't have to tell you you can hang up. But let's try and talk for an hour. And if it's interesting, in a week and a half, call me back. Uh, I still do, am doing a number of those calls. I still have not yeah. met them. And there can be no agenda, no agenda in our conversation. And I will not ask you for anything. And I'm not selling a charity or a business or I don't want, I don't want anything from you. Just have a conversation wherever it goes. One of them is a sort of top uh, geriatric uh, psychiatrist. And you would think I would have a lot to talk to him about because I'm old. But, but, and some of it is that I say, I don't believe in what you do. For the most part, I think it's a fucking crutch for people. And uh, except for people who are really in bad shape, you know, people who, you know, can't make it, you know, uh, out of their chair or some, I mean, you know, I think, yes, there's some people in it. But by and large, of the population of people who I know who go to your, your woolly mouth meetings, <laughs> is, and that's where that phrase came, uh, really are just, particularly the geriatric people, you know, they're going to talk about their aches and pains and their memory. What else the fuck are they going to talk about? Yes, sir. And you're going to help them through those terrors. And I say you shouldn't help be helped through those terrors. Those are the, you should go through them. Uh, and being helped makes you less able to help, less able to get through them. Or you're taking a soft path, which doesn't help you have the rich life that comes that you just hopefully go to sleep and you're dead. Uh, so that was a diversion, I know. But it, we are talking about when you think of things and the mind, and that yep. sort of skips. But it, 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 talking about that is the basic talk of what you're you're interested in of AI, the mind, creativity. Yes, the crutch that we use it for. Uh, do we use that crutch because it helps us? Uh, well, here's a crutch we're using right now. It helps us have this conversation. We're using technology to the extent that we're using it. I asked you to call me because I've never placed a Zoom call because I don't know how. But somebody else does, sets it up. So I take all the calls and ask people, please record it. And uh, I don't know how to do it myself. I... I struggle with my iPhone, and I have become dependent on the on the iPhone for for bringing a, 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 lots of qualities into my life, lots of things in my life, lots of interests in my life. So I find that interesting. But for the use of it, it could be it could be this big. That's how much I use of it. I mean, I get. I mean. It should be a paragraph wide so I can read something. It should be a bigger screen that I could unfold so I can see pics. Um, I should be able to talk on it, record on it. But it does so many other things. And I get I push all these things and I blink, blink, and I have all these apps, and then I have no idea what it, 
I don't use any of them. And uh, I get the best one because I have uh, enough plus a dollar, so I get a, a good machine. I mean, a, a, an Apple, which is not whose creativity, whose innovation, there's only, you were talking in the, before you came on board, you were talking about uh, uh, that you came upon me because of Latch. And, yeah. Uh, which I think is funny because I always present Latch. I said, here's the story behind Latch. I decided to write a book called Information Anxiety. Seemed like a good title. I wrote a book behind the title. I didn't write it, dictated it. I don't ever okay. write anything. I can't type. I literally can but, just pick out some things. I can't, when I say I can't do things, I can't do things. So I came to a chapter, I knew I had to come to a chapter if I was writing this about how you organize information. Because <clears throat> I realized how something was organized actually changes the information. You organize it one way, it means one thing. You got the same information, organize it another way, and it's something else. The, fall, the smallest fish to the largest fish. The bottom feeders to the top feeders. The ones that uh, eat only plants or nibble it. Some kind of stuff that we don't quite call other fish and have blood in them. And the ones that don't. And then the relationship between the sizes of those fish and what eat other fish and which ones don't. Like the shark, the the the, uh, the 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 whale shark that doesn't eat people, and up until recently, although it eats me, the Greenland shark, they didn't think would attack people because it hasn't in the past, but they think it might. It has a lower mandible that would the top mandible wouldn't. It's different. Um. I can go on, I don't want to go about that fish, but I did one book called Hats, which talked about a, a meeting of a whole town, and there was pe pegs on the wall when they walked in. Uh -huh. And they put their hat down on the peg as they walked in. And then that was the whole meeting, because that's the whole meaning of latch. Because the way they put them down there was uh, by time, how they came into the meeting. But you could also pull out which was the biggest hat, the smallest hat, how many how many people in there were policemen or something else from the hat, so how many people didn't wear hats, how many men, some somewhat, how many women. Just you could organ by organizing, putting them down, changing the organization of you. You knew a lot about the audience, so it was cracks, and that's what a way of trying to put an image in people's heads that was outside of their body. But when I when I did the um, the organization of things, I thought, okay, this is going to be a really difficult chapter because how do I describe the infinite ways you can organize things? And then I found I could only think of five ways. My preconception was there was a shitload of ways of organizing things. Yeah, yeah. And that I was going I to feel have like a that's why most people connect with it. That connect with it is it. It makes the world of data much smaller and and then I'm more attainable. You, I'm going to give you three more examples of that. Uh, I think all three not published. I don't think they're published. Maybe one is. Um, so when I got to it, I got these 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 five ways, and then somebody else wrote in. Uh, you know, if you change their order, it spells latch. I don't know who that person is. It was just somebody told me or wrote me. I said, shit, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't think of the acronym to begin with. Uh, I thought of Ted to begin with. Uh, but I didn't think of that one. And and then I presented it fairly rapid, or fairly uh, close to when I published that book, which was a popular book at the time. Uh, it would have been more popular if, had I written five years later. It was just a, it was about five years before people knew what I was talking about. 
And at that five year period, it would have been a, you know, a make it friends kind of book. However, it was popular enough. And the term became the term that became a term that people used. I mean, they don't connect yeah. it with me, but information anxiety is something people use. Latches used, and they don't connect it with me. It's just used because I kept on saying, there's these five ways that I found. I would sometimes tell a story. I said, if somebody can think of a six, my next speech I'll say is there's six ways. I said, it's not scientific. It's the only way <laughs> I can think up. It's the best I could do. And that's all yeah. I was the best I could do. And maybe the there's one that's that's on borderline that uh, a very good student of mine who worked for me for a long time, and it turned out to have a very, quite a successful career, believes I'm wrong and I should should include uh, chaos as a way of organizing. But I, it, it's almost by its name, it says I'm not organizing. Yeah, so, it's other. <laughs> yeah. It's other, really. And uh, <laughs> and I also would love selfishly to keep the word latch and not it doesn't spell anything if you use yeah, uh, yeah. another C or if you use random or whatever. Anyway, I choose not to, but it's open for that. And perhaps five years after I die or 10, somebody will change it around to something or find out another way of doing it. But the word latch and its five ways work. And yeah. I use it. And and so I, I do believe in it because when I start something, I automatically think which is the dominant way I want to organize this to get into the story. How those intersect, it's quite complicated because you're bringing in the ideas of what is taxed and what isn't taxed. A tax-free state I'm in, but certain of the bonds are tax-free anyway in a different way. And other things get all the, the, the federal taxes on against them. So the interest rates are not compatible. It's you're never in those three things between bonds, CDs, and money markets. It's not apples and apples. You're 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 doing uh, at at a certain bank at a certain tax rate, thirty seven, thirty nine percent. State taxes matter, and and uh, and federal taxes matter a lot. So it's it's a difficult thing to compare. And they do it verbally and they do it with charts, each one separately and never together and not comparatively and not by amounts. They do a very bad job. The right. job they are, they have to do because the SEC says this is the way you do it. I think there's several fields like that in which information can be mapped in a way that you can. Answer. Now, I just went through a whole bunch of things. Could AI, given the right directions, do that? Probably, but I think we have to do it first. Yeah, no, it's it's it, you can AI can help you. Uh, uh, I think uh, that AI can help you apply it to a um, to a, uh, a an existing map. It can help categorize it. It can help, but but somebody has to create the relevant map in the first place, and and. and and not a not a machine because it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't understand. Let me give you an interesting example. Let's assume Shakespeare did exist. Let's assume Shakespeare did write his sonnets and his plays. Let's just assume Listen. that. The body of evidence of evidence when I was young said no, he didn't. There was Francis Bacon. There was somebody else. But the body of evidence now says he did do it, and that there was a Shakespeare. He didn't have a typewriter. Would a typewriter made it better? Could you postulate, would it make it worse? Would it have just made it faster? And then would being writing them faster be better or worse for contemplating it and reading it and changing it and making changes it and having spell check? Or would it have made it worse? Yeah. And here's the corker. He invented 1,200 words. By the way, I listen to every word that everybody says, word by word, okay? Um, I don't know why I do that. I just got in the habit of seeing the word. And, and as I see it, I have words I remember. I mean, odd words. I don't remember the thes and the ins and the other things. But if you said the word very or uh-huh, 
or you said some other word. I would remember that you said it, and I chose not to correct it. Or if you used most of the people, which you were just getting to now, most of the people might do this. I don't give a fuck about most of the people. It's not a judgment. It's not a way of making a decision. It's not, you know, not voted for. It's like, you know, not, we, you know, the, the most, most of the people don't. They, they, I, were, I, I created TED. I ran it for 18 years. I, I chose every single speaker myself. I chose not one speaker because the audience suggested him or to please the audience or a committee wanted it or because they sponsored a lunch. And no speaker, this is not the way it's run today, by the way, but, and no speaker, no matter what lunch they did, I did I did I save a seat for them or could give a speech. And you couldn't sell even a good charity, one that I believed in from the stage or your next book, or you could just, it was about ideas. And if there was some product or something that was really a new idea, way of doing things, but you weren't clearly selling the product, you were talking about a breakthrough idea. Uh, I mean, uh, Gosling came up and talked about this thing called Oak, which was Java. Well, that was an idea. It was a breakthrough. That's a, yeah. that would. But Jane Goodall, I would not let her talk about her, her charity, and she almost walked out. I said, your mic is going to go down, go, go dead. It's a nice charity. Just give a speech. Talk about what you do. Don't ask for money. Now, that was not popular with the audience, but it was popular with me. So it, it can't, the most people think can't, can't, that, if you let that in, there's no place to draw the line. Yeah. And it's being let in in all the discussions on AI, IA, whatever it is. I get confused. Um, it's not about most people. It's about clarity. Yeah. Well, what's what I'm excited about is people with great ideas now may feel more comfortable sharing them because there's something that's going to correct their spelling and their grammar, and and therefore they don't they don't need to be as brave as you are, right? Or, or as as there's misspellings you know, as in all my books. There's misspellings in all my books, but you can figure out what the word was. Exactly. I mean, it's just, the ideas you know, matter. I'm not at school where I'm getting marked. I'm not taking, I'm not auditioning. Exactly. We're so, we're so programmed for the, 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 you know, the, the details that don't matter, you know, the. Would I like it not to have words spelled wrong? Yeah. It's a reflection of me and my sloppiness. It's okay. There's not many words, is it? People read it. They don't catch everything. It's okay. If there's 10 words, 20 words, wrong. I think some books I did are good and some aren't so good. And that's enough. Innovation happens because of need. You're starving. Yeah. You have to figure out a way of digging a well or getting water. It's driven by that. It's a reason that innovation is driven by that. Always doing the opposite. We just talked about that. Yeah. S is sub anything also subtraction is S. My conference and met, the, the Bauhaus was by subtraction. They subtracted everything out. But my conference, if you think about it in a different way, I took away panels, things that won't seem like much, but these were the building parts. These were what you had made and you started at this point when you designed the cop. Panels, white men in suits dressed up nicely, saving seats for speakers and sponsors, a lectern where you could put a speech down and read it, rehearsals, long speeches, single subjects, eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist, not medicine. <laughs> it was only on one subject, not on every subject. I can go on and on and on. But I took things away and all of a sudden I had a good conference. That's, that's an awesome story. Okay, then the last one, a nose, the E, is represented by the post-it note. It's an epiphany. Somebody did a glue that didn't work. They turned it into a post-it note. <laughs> oh, looks like we... There's other things that happen that are just ideas you can't predict. They just come from somewhere of doing it. In a sense, my TED conference came from my epiphany of, of so hating conferences and not going to them. What did I not like? 
That's sort of a personal epiphany. Nobody needed the TED conference. I didn't need it. Nobody needed it. Nobody asked me to do it. But I had this thought that if I took everything away and did this and that, I would enjoy going to it. It was a conference I wanted to go to. I realized I could have a life which was based on my indulgence rather than other people's desires. A minor point. The last one is not a good thing. But since we were talking about it, I brought it up. I wouldn't bring that up in a speech. I enjoy talking because I enjoy learning from myself. And I learn from myself because I can tell what is resonating with one other person. I can see their eyes. And it really helps me a great deal. It really. seems good for that. It's it's always it's good for it. I it's useful for me. And in the next six, eight months I'll be be working on I have a book of notes that is unusual, but I was on a cruise. And somebody gave me a, a blank book celebrating the 50th anniversary of a company. Very nice black book, soft and nice. And so I took notes in and I took it with me. And I must have filled up 40 pages of just little notes, just scribble. There was lines, but I didn't follow them. And, so, and uh, of just random things. I mean, there's a note in there that I went into a, a we were talking about peeing in the beginning of this conversation. And, uh, there was one urinal I went into uh, there that had a, a low one, but not low enough for children, just lower by five or six inches than a higher urinal. And they had a little plastic thing over the drain, which I've seen before. And sometimes they have ads on them with the company that makes them, which I always find strange to pee on. Pee on a company that you want to buy these. And they think that they'll sell their little piece of plastic over somebody else's because somebody's peeing on it, and it <laughs> the person that orders them isn't going to pee on it, probably. It's just, but anyway, there was this little thing, no name of a company, unless this is the name of the company, but a nice type in a sans serif old type with the letters A I M, AIM. <laughs> and it brought me back to aiming at the snow and try to make a pattern when you were kids and pee. Oh, uh, yeah. But it was just the word aim. And I thought it was so funny. <laughs> you know, the little thing called aim that you're going to obviously take your cock and aim on this thing. Yeah. It, was, it was a caption for what you should do. It was instructions for being. Where were you it's, going if you didn't aim at the, at the thing? It's the right name for a, for for a splash company. guard. Yeah. I, I guess so. Yeah. And then, then, I did, and then it also had the meaning. The, the profound meaning of that's what a splash guard is to tell you where to be. Anyway, those are the kinds of notes I took because those are the kind of fables I'm going to write. Right. <laughs> I guess we didn't talk enough about your, your uh, the subject du jour. That however, wasn't really the goal necessarily. However, I will steal the thing I did on, I said to you on, see, here's what I learned. That's mm-hmm. the first time I ever told that Shakespeare story. It's a good story. And I just thought it up talking to you. So, All right. uh, so it bore fruit both ways. That was useful for me, and I will write that as one of my fables. I'm glad to hear it. The thing on Shakespeare as a fable would be, uh, if any of those factors were different, can you even fantasize how that would change? And that the addition of, of, uh, of various technologies or various circumstances could possibly change it for the better or the worse, could change it for if you if, if the printing techniques were better and they could print more of them quicker or cheaper, would that be good? How is the translations? We know it's in many languages, but we don't know if they're good translations or not. Apparently, the German translation is very good because Shakespeare is enormously popular in Germany. I didn't know that. You know, there's a lot of things that you can just pull out of of just a little story that takes you on this journey and may, it allows me to think about, you know, I don't want to do away with typewriters. I don't want to do away with recording things. I don't want to re- do away with me talking it, get transcribing. 
I'm comfortable with that, those technologies, even though I can't do them. I'm comfortable with talking to my, to this bio, this archivist. And I've talked to him for about two hours a week for four or five years. Uh, and uh, he's literally thousands of pages of just storms. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy. It was emotionally wonderful to go back and remember things and go over the stories and go over my take on stories that I thought were one way, but now have a different meaning for me. Let me, let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Um, so you've, you've produced a lot, you have a, a lot of your thoughts and thinking and talking, uh, transcribed. What about, um, what do you feel about like training? I've unread, I've unread them. I've never read them yet, but go ahead. Yeah. But well, the same way that like chat GPT was kind of trained on the internet's knowledge. What yeah. if you had an AI that was trained on all of your thoughts, everything you'd transcribed and archived yeah. um, that could then be trained so that people could ask you questions without you being there. Is that idea appealing, appalling? <laughs> How do you feel about something like that? Because I've thought about it. I don't have as much writing out in the world, but I've thought about what if I fed it all to an AI and then I could ask for summaries of how I might write something? I would say if somebody wanted to do that, that would be fine. Yeah. Uh, I would never read it and I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't care. I, I'm rather distant. Uh, I don't have pride of authorship. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it doesn't bother me that... Uh, Anything that I say is then repeated by somebody else. And sometimes they, not always, but they sometimes take credit for it because I see it. And yeah. It does, and I think that should really bother you. And it really doesn't bother me that much because it's all, because I know I'm going to come up with another idea. I think if that's all I did and that was my idea, let's say my whole life got based on latch <laughs> and it went out latch three, latch four, and Mr. Acronym. <laughs> uh, okay. We'll, we'll see each other some other time. All right. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks again for tuning in to Invisible Machines. Don't forget to follow Invisible Machines wherever you get your podcasts so that you can hear new episodes as soon as they drop. You can also watch this podcast on the Invisible Machines YouTube channel. Thank you so much to everyone who listens to this podcast and especially to those of you who leave comments because we've received a lot of really useful commentary that has helped us shape this podcast as we move forward with it. Thank you as always to our producers, Elias Parker, Kate Timchenko, and our video editor, Michael Litvinov for making this podcast look and sound wonderful. We look forward to catching up with you again next week right here on Invisible Machines.